Hey everybody, welcome back to another May Day Monday. It is um, the May 2023 May Day Monday. I want to first apologize that I didn't have anything out on the first Monday of the month, um, but it, it kind of caught crept up on me. Um, all of a sudden I look and it's May 1st, which was the first Monday of May. Um, so it's been busy and um, I apologize again for not getting it out, but this will be out the second Monday of the month. And hopefully it'll still be as worthwhile. Um, before we get too deep into this, uh, like we have in the past few, I'd like to read out the names of those firefighters we have lost in the line of duty since the last time we were together. Uh, Sussex, New Jersey firefighter Anthony. Let me share my screen here because I got the names up here for you. Here's our uh, topic for this month, and here's the names. Uh, firefighter Anthony Dweven Vorde, I hate to uh, butcher that name, uh, from Sussex, New Jersey. Um, he was um, he suffered a heart attack after responding to several fire alarms. Uh, Cody Mullins, uh, West Virginia Division of Forestry, was killed by a falling tree while battling a wildfire. Horace Wright, uh, with the Abbott Volunteer Fire Department from Abbott, Texas, um, was struck and killed while, while while operating on the scene of a motor vehicle crash on the highway. Deputy Chief Chester Locke of the Frederick County, Virginia Fire Department, not too far away from Mayday Monday headquarters here. Um, he uh, died after um, he was battling a long duration wildfire and started suffering several heart attacks and uh, he could not recover from that. Uh, Captain Roy Sewell of the North Taswell Volunteer Fire Department in Tennessee was killed in an apparatus rollover accident. And firefighter Fred Federer, Chester Fire Department, Chester, South Dakota, suffered an apparent heart attack while on the scene of an agricultural facility fire. Uh, the USFA has 27 line of duty deaths of, uh, so far in 2023. Please um, say some prayers. Uh, have Put these people in your thoughts. And... Um, Say some prayers for the families, friends, uh, everybody involved in these incidents. As I mentioned, it was a busy April. Um, this past week, this past week was the FDIC International, and um, it did not disappoint. Uh, while there was a a big void um, in this year's FDIC with the passing of Bobby Halton, um, I think that the fire service is going to carry on in 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 honor of Bobby, right? All the stuff that he has done and carry it on in his, in a tradition that he would be proud of. Um, with that, I was uh, out there and uh, our guest tonight, I saw David in the hallways and we stopped and chatted, ex exchanged pleasantries, uh, learned about his kid. He had his kid out there. He was out, um, I guess it was a good ploy to get, he told his kid he had to get good grades in order if he wanted to go to FDIC and he got his best grades yet. So uh, whatever it takes, I guess. Um, so again, I saw him out there. Unfortunately, I didn't go to his class. I think maybe he was presenting the same time I did, but at any rate, I didn't make it by there. Um, coming back, I did uh, look through some pictures that people posted from their week at FDIC and I, um, came on to David's stuff and it looks like he had a good time. And one of the pictures was of his class and, uh, the title of his class was a medical response to a firefighter maydays. And I'm like, that's, that's perfect for may may day monday of 2023 so um in an exchange of uh, messengers and uh, emails um here he is he uh, made it made it on the show um so again you guys again david what we've done here at may day mondays is talk about firefighter survival right our own survival and then also about firefighter rescue and um we we do a lot on on uh, rescuing right rescuing trapped firefighters all the different things right denver columbus um, below grade, above grade, um, you know, tight openings on the roof, everything. Um, and then we, we really kind of don't, don't carry it on from there. Once we get them out now, what, right? So that's kind of what this month's theme is, is okay. We've rescued them. Now what? And, um, it sounds like maybe you have some stuff to offer with that. Can you do a, a quick introduction of
while we're lucky enough to kind of go into the the urban area, uh, if you will. And so uh, I've, I've gotten a really good, well-rounded uh, career just based off of the different areas that I've worked in. Uh, I've done some career, some full-time, some full-time, some part-time, and some volunteer uh, firefighting, and I've served in a, a multitude of different levels uh, of the, the hierarchy. And so currently, uh, I'm an interim deputy chief slash EMS supervisor, uh, and then I just was promoted to assistant chief at uh, my volunteer department, so I've been uh, doing that for uh, about a few, few months now. But I uh, started in the fire service in 1998 when uh, RIT was just becoming a thing. And uh, so I grew up in the era of the kind of the inception of RIT, and we were learning a lot about the Denver drill and things like that. And so uh, I've gotten to watch as we've progressed through a lot of different things uh, in May Days, how we call them, how we deal with them. Uh, and then fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, I've been involved in two May Days myself, uh, and I have a several other May Days that I was on scene for. Uh, and one of which I was in command of. So I've gotten a kind of a well-rounded experience. Again, whether you want to say it's fortunate or unfortunate, uh, I've gotten to experience that. And so uh, that's kind of where the class came from with some of my experiences. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's a funny thing, right? I, I guess we go to a lot of writ classes and um, I don't know that I want to take a writ class from someone that's gone to a lot of firefighter rescues. <laughs> you know, I want someone... It's, it's it's kind of like right. It's like a catch twenty two. Like I want to go to a, I want to go to a class on high rise fires of a guy that's gone to a hundred high rise fires, but I don't want to go to a class of a guy that's gone to a hundred firefighter rescues. That right. maybe maybe he's in the wrong fire department or or there's something going on. So um, it's it's tough, and and how do and the best the best learning is experience, right? We have to, we we know that that's the best way to learn. But these aren't things that we want to be. We want to want to have them, right? And um, then to, to so I can't imagine the stress. I was involved in a firefighter May Day. I was the rescuer, so I didn't really have a. I didn't. I was the rescuee, so I didn't have a, you know, a, a worry about command and that kind of thing. So, um, but and I have been, you know, with some firefighter injuries, but nothing uh, stressful like that. So I, I could see where that would motivate you to kind of want to. Let's not let's let's make sure we can get this right, right? And what does right, right look like? I guess. So good, um, Kansas. I was just out there. I was just out there um, in Ottawa, yeah, Kansas, uh, doing um, a, a UL thing um, last. I guess it was before. It was cold, I think. So um, I was out there and. I guess I guess I, I didn't realize exactly where where this was, but you're like you're like you can't get much more dead center of the country than than Reno Township, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so Ottawa is actually about forty five minutes or an hour south of me. So you were you were really close, and uh, yeah, the center of the country. I mean, it's funny because you're in downtown Kansas City, and then you're where my full time department is. Uh, kind of on the western edge of the metro, and then there's cornfields and cows, and then all of a sudden you're in Lawrence, and then there's nothing, and then there's Topeka, and then there's really nothing, and then you're in Colorado. So that's pretty much Kansas. Yeah, that's crazy. And um, Lawrence, that's where K State is, right? Uh, KU. Oof. Oof. Yeah, that's KU. K State is uh, out in Manhattan. It's a little further west. Okay, I got you. So it's further west, really, out there where there is nothing. Yeah, it's and again, Manhattan is another one of those cities where I mean, you drive for hours and it's flatlands, and then you're in a town of you know forty, fifty, sixty thousand. So. Yeah, I I guess I I didn't really appreciate how flat it was till I was there, you know, and it definitely is uh, pretty amazing, um, and it's it's cool to see the different. I mean, you've been. I'm sure you travel all over the country now with your teaching. You go to Pacific Northwest, and it's amazing. And then you go to Absolutely. Kansas, it's crazy. You go to Denver area, you get up to the high mountains, it's pretty cool. So it's it's a it's interesting out there. But Kansas is not really one that I was real familiar with until, like I said, we went there, to Kansas City and um, Ottawa. Ottawa was, was a neat little town. So good. So you guys, you do uh, you have Valor Fire training? Is that your group? I do. Yep. I started Valor Fire Training in 2015. And what does that focus on? 
So we, we do a couple different, yeah, I mean, it's kind of everything. So we have instructors from a lot of different areas of life. So we have career urban firefighters uh, who work on truck companies and they do truck company classes. Um, I deal with more of the realistic fire training, the medical response to the May Day, uh, and some command stuff. And then we have other people, like we have a, a person who's on a technical rescue team, uh, and just actually they started a, a rescue company within their department, and he headed that project up. So he does a lot of our rescue stuff. So uh, whoever the subject matter expert is teaches the class, and then the other instructors are uh, support staff for that instructor. So it's worked out really well for us. Um, we've turned down a few classes just because there's other people out there doing stuff better than we can. Uh, and that's the one thing about Valor is that we don't uh, we don't shy away from trying to get the best educational experience for the students. Um, so we're we're really good at what we teach, um, but we don't come up with stuff just to make a dollar. It's yeah. it's not what we're about. So um, career department is that the Reno Township? No, so that's uh, it's city of Edwardsville. Uh, it's a suburb in the uh, Wyandotte County, so the same area as Kansas City, Kansas. I gotcha. And that, that you say is more urban, more suburban. Yeah. So we actually, it's, it's a really unique area. So we have the nation's largest FedEx depot and a bunch of other million square foot <laughs> warehouses. And then about a mile and a half West of there, there's a couple trailer parks and uh, we have a couple high rises. We have some nursing homes and then we have rural kind of urban interface areas to the north of our district. So we really have, I mean, we could be running a smells and bells in a, you know, million square foot warehouse. And then 30 minutes later, we're running a medical in a trailer. So it's, it's a lot of different uh, areas in a very small space. And then the, the volunteer place, where is that? Yeah. So that's Leavenworth County uh, out West. So uh, we have about a hundred square miles that we cover. Uh, we're just becoming a fire district with another department. So uh, we're going to have 113 miles total with uh, four stations. So it's, oh, wow. uh, it's, yeah, it's quickly, quickly growing. And uh, you know, we've, we've transitioned into a combination department just this year. Uh, we hired our first full-time firefighter. You see the struggle there with getting volunteers. And I mean, I guess it's the same struggle with getting career people too. It is. And, you know, it's, it's, we were just having this discussion the other day. We have a lot of career firefighters that live in our area, uh, but they don't want to volunteer. And I, I get that. Uh, and so we, we have about uh, 52 firefighters uh, within our staff for the volunteer side. Uh, and everybody does a really good job. We haven't missed a call yet. Um, we do have mutual aid and things like that, but uh, we've, we've always had kind of prided ourselves on making sure that we have coverage for our area. Okay, so uh, let's take this um, let's take this this podcast into the the subject matter here. Um, again, we we we've, we've been we've been working really heavily on May Day Monday about five hundred rescue. Um, some of the recent things have been you know SCBA stuff where you have uh, you have to go in and find someone and give them air you know and, and extract them. We've been looking at some commercial building stuff. We looked at. Um, Again, the Brett Tarver, we, we revi- revisited that a couple of months ago with um, with Chris Stewart from Phoenix and uh, looking at commercial building fires there. So um, we, it, we did touch on removal, right? Removal. So now we, we've got them out. Now what are we going to do with them? Um, what, what are we going to do with them? So it's it's a really broad question. Uh, but let's let's back up just for a second. So I, you know, the question, uh, you know, what do we do with them now? It's one of the things that I've seen firsthand, and the reason why we came up with the class, um, because you know, a lot of times we focus on RIT as a skill. So you know, the RIT team is going to go in, find the down firefighter. Uh, I always use the term: it's over the hill, through the woods to Grandma's house we go. And then once we find that down firefighter, they're always unresponsive. They're always, you know, unconscious, uh, not breathing, no pulse. And I don't know if they add, it always feels like they add about 400 more pounds to what that dummy would have been. And so we drag that dummy out, but on the way out, we can't use the doors. We can't use the windows that we find. Nothing's in play. Right about the time that we get low on air, uh, we got to call for RIT team two because we got to cycle those students. And then once we finally get that firefighter out, uh, once they cross the threshold, everybody slaps high fives and they go reset the mannequin. 
And so uh, I learned this from a student about a year ago at a class. I kept using the word training scars. Uh, and he said, you know, I don't like training scars. And I said, why? And he goes, well, scars, once you get them, they're there. You can't ever get rid of them. He goes, it's training wounds because you can take care of the wound and you can minimize the scar. And I was like, All right, Brilliant. Man, I, I like that. I'm going to steal that. And he was like, absolutely. So it's a training wound that we have that I've seen time and time again in firefighters is that when we really do have a firefighter either have a medical emergency or a traumatic event, slip, trips, falls, whatever, we don't know how to take care of them because we've never incorporated that into our writ training. And so the, the broad question of what do we do once we get them out, um, it starts with what kind of mate are they having? You know, are they having a medical emergency? Is it something that we realize as the crew that's with the firefighter? Did they fall? Uh, was there a uh, rapid fire progression? And based on that, uh, we have to make a couple decisions. So I always try to teach EMS in one way. It's not ALS, it's not BLS, it's just EMS. And so this really applies to, I'm not going to get into med dosages and things like that. This is something that somebody with a CPR and a first aid card could do. But when we talk about a down firefighter, the first thing we need to do is figure out what they're going to need. So if we're talking about a firefighter who, uh, you know, fell through a floor and we're listening to the radio traffic and it sounds like their Viber alerts going off, what's the next step after that Viber alert stops working? No air right? So as a medical responder or somebody who's going to be taking care of that patient, I need to start thinking about airway management. I need to start thinking about how am I going to get this person to a hospital that can treat airway burns. Uh, if I'm out in a rural area, it might be a helicopter. If it's a ground transport, where's my closest ambulance? Um, and so once we find that down firefighter, we need to assess them. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we talk about, and I'm going to pose a lot of questions to you if that's okay. Yeah. But uh, what for the listeners, what I want them to think about is we all know what a melted shield looks like, right? We all know what a melted face mask looks like. But what about your gear? So, like, Tony, I'm going to ask you, what kind of gear do you wear? I wear uh, glow gear, uh, morning pride gear. Okay, so black morning pride gear. morning pride black gear. Do you, know, do you happen to know what the material is? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's... Um... PBI or what, what, the, what the, the material is now. Yeah, so just to give a quick example, so PBI starts to degrade and breaks apart at 1,200 degrees. Nomex starts to degrade and falls apart around five or 600 degrees. And then there's every material in between. So really, if I get to a downed firefighter and I know that they wear PBI and their gear is starting to fall off as I'm moving them, I know that they have thermal insult and that they're probably going to have significant burns. And so those are things that we need to communicate out to the people outside so that they can be prepared for once that firefighter gets out. Um, so once we get outside, to get to your question, uh, once we get outside, we really need to start focusing on rapid removal from the gear in the most efficient way. Uh, and then we need to start addressing it just like we would any other medical patient. Um, so whether it's a, or a trauma patient. So it goes back to airway, breathing, circulation, transport decision, and are we going to stay in play? There's a couple caveats to that uh, that I'll get into here in a minute. But for the most part, we still need to get those firefighters out because their best chance of survival or to reduce the furthering of an injury uh, is us taking care of them outside. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's 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 crazy, right? I mean, that. I guess the best thing we want to do is give them the best chance of survival, right? Just like, and, and I'll go back to uh, this month's dedicated to my friend, uh, Kevin McRae. He was a close guy, close with me. I, um, we ran a lot together in DC and he died of a, of a massive heart attack back in, uh, back May of, uh, 2016, 2015. And, um, he didn't get the best chance. Um, the, you know, and again, I, you can imagine, I mean, you can imagine this guy was like the, like the poster child of DCFD. Right. And, um, everybody loved Kevin. Everybody that knew Kevin loved Kevin. And he was a fire, he was a fireman. He was a good man. He was a good guy. He was, uh, like I said, I'd put him on the poster to be for the advertisement. 
and he dropped dead on the scene of this fire at seven in the morning. So, you know, it was bright, shiny, shiny Monday or a May and a beautiful day. He drops dead and he's, you know, mere blocks from the hospital. And of course, there's no plan, right? There, we didn't plan on the, the, the doffing of gear really quick. We didn't plan on getting him out of his SCBA. So I can only imagine what it looked like. And then, you know, getting him into the ambulance, which again, it was probably six, seven blocks to the hospital, up the road. But I know we didn't give him the best chance. So, um, right, and we, we do everything else, all that stuff, all that cool stuff that we do, we ramp up for the writ and get inside and rescue him. And then, but then once we get outside, yeah, it kind of all falls apart. Um, so those little things that you talked about, which are, uh, I guess, again, um, if you know that this gear is, is damaged, right, if this gear is damaged, he's, got, he's gotten a severe thermal insult. If this gear is damaged, maybe not so bad, right? So if we're wearing, if we're wearing old Globe gear, or I'm sorry, wearing old Nomex gear, or we're wearing brand new um, state-of-the-art uh, PBI, PBX, PBO, whatever the, whatever the latest thing is, Right. It's, it's going to tell us a little bit different about how badly they were they were they were damaged. So that's good stuff. And we can send that back out and then they can start lining up the caregivers to give this guy the best chance. So. All right. So we've got him. You make some of those calls. Uh, let's go down. Let's go down the burn route. Uh, one question I have and we talk about getting that gear off quickly. Um, should we be, you know, pulling it off or should we cut it you know I, th I think that I always thought that we didn't want to like try to we wanted to try and keep everything intact with a burn right um, so how do we get the gear off for that so and we actually talk about this in the class and it's a great question so what I always tell everybody is it's life over limb right so the bunker gear itself once we expose the chest we can do chest compressions right? So we can start doing circulation. Um, and everything else kind of becomes ancillary. As long as we have access to the chest, we have access for CPR, defibrillator pads. Uh, once we get the arms out, we have access for an IV, the humeral head, you know, all those things <clears throat> without diving into too much stuff. Um, but, you know, to your point, and the, what I usually talk about in the class is if we believe that somebody has significant burns, uh, the last thing I want to do is pull their boot off and then look down in the boot and go, hey, can we slide that back on? Right. Uh, and I don't try to sound morbid, but I, I mean, it's a thing, right? I mean, skin sloughs off. And so we don't want to cause more damage and more harm. Uh, and so with burns, what we talk about is is the methodical removal with scissors. And when I say scissors, obviously trauma shears, um, you would be amazed at what you can cut through with just a a pair of trauma shears. Um, there's some other really good stuff out there. I know the Colony Texas uh, put out a post last year uh, about a material cutter. It's like a commercial grade material cutter that does a really good job of cutting through some uh, turnout gear. But yeah, we want to be able to slow down. And if you cut, you know, down the sides of a pair of bunker boots, whether they're leather or rubber, uh, once you get down to the ankle, they really just kind of pop off. Um, now, if there's no risk of, of burns, Absolutely. You know, the, the traditional firefighter CPR gear removal works fantastic. So to just to pull that off over their head. Yeah. The, the, where you pull the coat up uh, and then you grab the pants and pull the pants off and kind of slide them up and down. Um, that works great as long as you're not dealing with burns, but if you're going to deal with burns, it's better to, you know, cut down the sleeves, uh, remove the coat, cut down the pants, uh, and really you can cut the front and just kind of fillet them open and the firefighter will just come out with very minimal damage. Okay. So that's good. That's good. Cause I, I, we have to, if we know that we're bringing somebody out, there's chances of burns. Don't do the, um, real quick, right. Take some time because, um, well that, I think that that, again, if it's a CPR thing, it could be different, right. But if it's just yeah. burns, yeah. Yeah, no, that's what you said, life over limb. So let's get that, let's get them moving. Um, okay, so we got the burns. What about um, smoke inhalation and that kind of thing? Do you get into, you know, what kind of um, um, interventions we have for that? 
Yeah, so we do. So it's it's actually really interesting. So I got with a couple different SCBA manufacturers, and one of the things that we were talking about was if you find a firefighter and they're down and either their mask has failed, uh, so the mask has melted or the mask was displaced or it's just gone altogether, firefighters out of air, um, when you look at most of the exhalation valves, whether it's an MSA, Scott, Drager, uh, they're all right around 14 to 15 centimeters of water in order to push off. So if you think about like a CPAP, uh, for those of us who have sleep apnea, the CPAP, or if you carry one on your uh, department, that's about 10 centimeters of water. So it's a little bit more pressure to be able to get exhalation, but we're still flooding the lungs with, uh, with air. Right. So if I turn on that bypass uh, and we have a firefighter who had smoke inhalation, we're still able to kind of flush out some of those toxins within the lungs, Uh, whether they're breathing or not. We still have air going in and air coming back out. And so uh, it was really interesting. We did a couple uh, Valor Fire Training, did a couple studies with some pig lungs where we just constantly flowed air uh, and we exposed it to. dye infused like fake smoke Um, and it was really cool to watch how much stuff was actually coming out just with 15 or 16 centimeters of airflow um, in through the lungs so to put it back into perspective that's why we're turning on the bypass you know everybody just turns it on because that's what they were told but nobody understands really why we're doing that Um, so if we have a firefighter who's not breathing and we turn on that bypass we are putting fresh air into their lungs Uh, And so once we get them outside, we need to start thinking about airway control. So whether it's innovation or putting in some sort of secondary airway uh, or worst case scenario, uh, some sort of surgical airway. And so that in some areas falls back to a helicopter. Uh, In other areas, it falls back to the ambulance. But those are things that are kind of time sensitive. And so knowing that that firefighter has smoke inhalation and isn't breathing As a paramedic myself, I'm going to start setting up some of that time-sensitive things so that they're ready to go. If I don't need them, I'll put it back or I'll throw it away. I don't care. Uh, But those are things that I want to set up so that I'm not wasting time once that firefighter comes out. So uh, let's back up a little bit. You talked about the leaders per minute flow with the bypass. What was that? So it's it's 14 to 15 centimeters of water. 14, 15 centimeters of water. So we may not want to take the mask off really, huh? Until we have everything in place. Yeah. So, I mean, what we do a lot of times for us, uh, when we talk about doing firefighter CPR, when we crack that bypass, as long as it's sealed and we have air, uh, we just leave it on because essentially as you're doing compressions, it's no different. It's actually better if you think about it. Um, and this is all empirical. This isn't, you know, I don't have any statistics to back this up, but if I'm flushing air into the lungs and I'm doing compressions, that's the same thing as putting on a non rebreather, which a lot of departments do. So yeah, and we don't uh, have that you know, yet, right? So I just got them right. out. We don't have it yet, and we talk about you know taking that off, but let's leave it on. Let's leave that. Maybe leave that on while you're getting everything else off, if you can. I could see where it could right. be. It could it could be a, a you know a pain to kind of manage that and get the rest off. But maybe that's a new technique we could come up with somehow leaving yeah, the and piece it, piece on. Yeah. And as a secondary byproduct of that, and we talk about this a lot in the class as well, when we get to the hands-on part, a lot of times when firefighters come out, if they're off gassing or their gear is off gassing, it's a lot of really nasty stuff to be inhaling. So if they are breathing on their own and I take their mask off right away and their gear is still off gassing, that's a lot of really nasty stuff that they're inhaling, like hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen cyanide. And so if I can leave that mask on, even if it's knocked somewhat off, if I have that bypass on, or if it's bleeding by, that's actually protecting their airway. No, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. And again, something else that we can we can think about. And, um, you know, we're going to push that out, push the, uh, the skill drill out for the firefighter CPR. And uh, those that are watching here, maybe that's something you could try and, and, and do with your when you try that the next time is try and leave the face piece on uh, while you take the rest off. All right, good. All right, so where else? Where are we now? We've got the, we've got him out. CPR. We got him. We got him. Got him out of his gear. Um, burns. We've taken care of the burns because we we cut the gear off of instead of just pulling it off off of him. Um, any other kind of other injuries that we haven't thought about? I mean, yes. Yeah, 
fractures. Uh, yeah, so so it's funny because the number one cause of injury for firefighters, by and large, uh, it's over fifty percent is uh, slips, trips, and falls. And myself, in my own department, I had the nickname of Twinkle Toes for a while uh, because I couldn't stay vertical. It didn't matter what fire scene I was on; I was always falling over something. And so, uh, and, and the, you, you, know, you don't slips- know Dave. If you guys don't know Dave, and you don't appreciate him by looking at his picture that. Dave's Dave's not a small guy, um, and you know it would be quite quite a show if he does take a header. So it is, and and I always end up hurting myself somehow on every fire that I go to, and and usually I, you know, luckily it's only minor stuff. But so with the minor injuries, when we talk about wounds, fractures, uh, dislocations, things like that, um, it's really supportive care. Right. The one caveat to that, and one of the things that I really kind of push is um, immediate life threats. So I'm going to ask you, what do you carry in your rib bag? Uh, we're carrying, you know, cutters. We're carrying um, some webbing, the Andy Anderson rescue kit. Um, that's about it. Okay. And obviously, you have your cylinder and you have your regulator yeah, 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 and all yeah, that stuff, air, right? Air bottle with, uh, you know, face piece and, and, uh, yeah, and a regulator, yes. Sure. So where's your medical bag? Um, on the rig. Okay. So your rig might be two blocks down the street, depending on you know where your jurisdiction is and how you run your fires. Um, so in our rip bag, we carry four cat tourniquets and two Israeli dressings. So we carry these in a very specific spot in our bag. Uh, the Israeli bandages, uh, we actually bought the ones that are in the white package because the, the tactical ones are hard to see at night and when we're uh, in limited visibility. And then we went with the bright orange cat tourniquet, and we actually keep this staged completely unattached because going around bunker gear, uh, there's no way that we're going to be able to do it like we would in a tactical scenario. So the reason why we carry these is because where's that rip bag on every fire or it should be on every fire. Where? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it should be right in front, right? Or at, at the place where the most where the hazard is, where the where where we're worried. Yeah, so on most fires that I go to and on most fires that I know, with with a few exceptions, right? I can walk around and say, hey, who has a six-foot hook? And everybody looks around. Or I can say, hey, where did the K-12 go? And everybody looks around. But if I ask where that rip bag is, everybody knows that it's in the front yard, right? And so that was the one spot that we knew that that stuff was going to be, that we always had it. Now, it's not just for us. It can be used for civilians. But when we look at significant injuries with hemorrhage, uh, a really, really bad arterial bleed, whether it's from a glass cut or a chainsaw or anything like that, uh, you have about 30 seconds before you go unconscious. So if I can get a tourniquet on over the gear and I can slow the bleeding down, that buys me time. And so that was the one thing that we stressed uh, for my own department and then we actually incorporated it into the class was we're not trying to solve the problem. We're just trying to slow it down to give us time so that we can assess the firefighter. Uh, and so, you know, between the two options, you know, we have places that we can tourniquet. There's obviously places that we can't like the neck, the armpit, the groin. Uh, and so we can cover those bases with what we have in the rip bag. Yeah, I really like that. That's, that's a, um, that's a great tip. Um, and again, um, you guys, you guys watching, right? Take this home, add some stuff, add some of this stuff for the life threats, right? We're not talking about like bandaging, you know, a, a, a scrape. We're not talking about splinting, you know, a broken arm. We're talking about life threats. And um, it, it's a good, that's good stuff. So good, good. What else? Where else can we go? So, and a lot of, and, and just to go back to what you were saying. So, you know, the splinting and things like that, and I don't mean to sound crude, and I believe me, uh, I've told my friends that, hey, if this happens, you can rub it in my face. That's fine. But, you know, a broken finger or a broken hand or a broken arm, uh, my objective is to get that firefighter out. That's not going to kill them in the next five minutes. It's not going to kill them in the next 30 minutes. Uh, Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's going to suck for a few minutes. I'll give you lots of happy drugs in the ambulance. Um, But, you know, what we kind of focus on is the immediate life threat. So 
to go back to the what else, uh, you know, we talk in the class a lot about the other things that are the big killers. So cardiac events, uh, chest pain, stroke, uh, even something as simple as diabetics. So I have a diabetic uh, firefighter on my crew. And usually throughout the day, we can tell if his sugar's getting low because he gets hangry. Um, but if we're in a fire and he starts slurring his words or acting goofy, we know that something's not right with him. And that's happened before. Uh, and so if you think about it, that's, I mean, you're in a immediately dangerous to health and I mean, you're in an ideal H environment and you're having a diabetic emergency. To me, that's a mayday. That's something that needs to be addressed right now because that can go very South, very quick. Um, and so luckily we've never had to call a mayday, but in our trainings, we actually do scenarios like that where it's not just a down firefighter that's unconscious, not breathing, uh, or an immediate life threat like hemorrhage. We have somebody who just kind of doubles over and starts rubbing their chest while they're doing a search, and the students have to notice that and address it. And so getting that firefighter out and getting the information out. Hey, we have a firefighter that's having chest pain. We're coming down on the Bravo side. Um, that's a great opportunity for the crews to get all that equipment over there so that we can start assessing them as soon as they come out. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, right. We have to think about all these things. I know um, we saw some recent, you know, maydays. I don't know if they were maydays, but we had some line of duty deaths with pump operators operating pumps on the outside, right? They might be a block away and they're operating a pump. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, I don't know about your, it should, you should kind of know your fire department demographics. And if you have people, you know, who who's operating what, are they, you know, do they have cardiac issues? Are they, the, are they the, the healthiest person or not? Or, you know, who's where on your fire scene so you can prepare for these things. And, and it may not, it may not be right. Like you say, it may not be the, the uh, flashover that gets over. It may not be the fall into the basement. It could just be a medical emergency that is happening and we need to get them out of the IDLH uh, as well. So good, good, good. All right. So we got um, some other medical stuff. We got um, burns, the CPR thing, um, any other rabbit holes we can go down? Yeah. So one of the ones that I really like kind of going down and, and uh, I'm going to coin a term or use a term that uh, Brian Brush coined. So I was presenting down in Edmond this class and we were talking about cyano kits. And if you're not familiar for those watching, uh, the cyano kit is a, a rapid inter intravenous medication that uh, essentially works kind of like activated charcoal for cyanide. And so it absorbs the cyanide and then you excrete it out of your body. So uh, when we talk about cyanide poisoning, one of the things that uh, cyanide does in the body is it makes your heart irritable. It can cause tachypnea or fast breathing, chest pain, uh, altered mental status, and then eventually cardiac arrest. I would, I would beg to say that if we look at the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of those same symptoms that led up to firefighters going into cardiac arrest, we attributed to heart attacks or sudden cardiac arrest, but we didn't know why. And so in my own experience, when we have hydrogen cyanide monitors, those things are going off even through like overhaul, right? So I take that mask off and I'm sucking in air that has hydrogen cyanide in it. Uh, and it takes very little to make your heart really, really angry and all it takes is the right situation and you go into cardiac arrest. So with that cyanide kit, when I was talking about it, I kept trying to find a good analogy. And Brian Brush, who did this year's uh, keynote uh, at FDIC on day two, he was sitting in the back and he goes, yeah, it's like Narcan for fires. And I went, oh, man, that's perfect. Like, I, that's why you get paid the big bucks, and I'm just the schmuck up here on the stage talking to the firefighters. But it, it really, I mean, it, it really is. And so when you look at the statistics and the data for cyanide kits, uh, it is tremendous, the amount of return of spontaneous circulation. They're bringing people back from cardiac arrest with the administration of this. And even better, they're preventing people from going into cardiac arrest. So if you give it prophylactically, like a firefighter that comes out that has smoke inhalation, there's no side effects. The only real problem is that you pee bright fluorescent orange for like a week. That's That'd be kind of cool. It's a cool party trick, yeah. right? But yeah. if it keeps me from going into cardiac arrest or it brings me back, I think it's worth it. 
Uh, and so if you look at like uh, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, uh, some of the other areas around those metropolitan areas, they're handing this stuff out to every fire victim. And they've had really, really good success. Wow. That's a great testament there for for the use of that. And I know there's a lot of places that uh, it's kind of expensive, right? It is. So it's about $2,000 a dose. Um, and, and full disclosure, my department can't afford it. Like we just don't have it in a budget to be able to afford that. Um, this year I was able to secure one dose. That's it. And it's got, and a, so, short, it's got uh, a short shelf life too, right? Two years. And so what we ended up doing is we partnered with some of the local hospitals with some of the air uh, transport and some of the other fire departments in the metro that have it. And we came up with a game plan that if we have one firefighter down, we're going to call for the closest cyano kit. If we have multiple firefighters down, we're going to contact the helicopters. Yeah. They're going to fly to the local burn center and pick up as many doses as they can and bring them to us. So we were able to sit down and kind of come up with that plan. And that's what we talk to a lot of people about is even if you can't afford it, just find out where it is and try to come up with a plan ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, obviously it'd be great to have one on every medic unit, but I know in my, my old department, they were talking about maybe the safety officer would carry it or one or two, because again, typically, right. You're not going to have a firefighter by himself, usually right. teams of two. So if he carried a couple of them and then, you know, that, that he's going to go to every fire in the city. Um, again, there may be that chance where there's two, two fires going on at the same time, but, um, it's rare. So, um, the benefits of that are, are, you know, are pretty dramatic. It sounds like, um, well, that's cool. That's good stuff. All right. So we got, um, smoke inhalation. We got some, some burn care. We got, we even got a uh, bleeding, bleeding care with tourniquets. That's a good idea. That's a good takeaway from this. Um, anything else that we haven't covered? So one of the things that I wanted to touch on, uh, and, and you already hit the nail on the head as far as the firefighter CPR. Um, we know that firefighter CPR works. We've seen firefighters who have gone into cardiac arrest and have received CPR uh, through their gear. And so I'm going to pose a question to you, and I already know the answer because we kind of did some, some research on it. But when you bring that firefighter out and you start doing compressions, we're expecting that you're doing enough good to circulate blood to the brain, correct? Yes. Okay. So if I'm in a situation where, and I'm going to be very specific about how I say this, if I'm in a situation where I need to take refuge somewhere, so I need to duck into a room, I'm on a second floor, I'm calling for a ladder, I'm in a safe area, but I have a down firefighter and I have to wait three or four minutes for that ladder, What's not happening while we're waiting? No circulation, nothing. No circulation. So if I think that that firefighter is in cardiac arrest, if I know that that CPR is going to work out in the front yard, why am I not doing it while we're waiting on that ladder? I, yeah, I, I think that, you know, we, the, the, the issue obviously is stress, right? The stress reaction is to think about your focus on yourself and, and sure. yourself. You're you trying to get out. And now, um, you know, you're they're probably not focusing on how I can help my buddy, but absolutely. Right. If we have time, if we have time while we're waiting, start something. Yeah. And so what, and, and this is the part where I, I'm very specific about what I say. Uh, you know, if you're in a really, really bad spot, if you're jammed up and you have direct fire in front of you, that is not the time to stop and do CPR. If you are, you know, trapped in a void and you are low on air and there's no way for you to get out, that is not a time to start doing CPR. Um, what I'm talking about is specifically in those moments of pause, um, what we did is we partnered with one of our local vendors who sells cardiac monitors uh, and it'll remain unnamed, but we actually took their CPR measurement device and we taped it to a CPR mannequin, full arms, legs, everything. We put that thing into bunker gear. And we ran full on scenarios. We did not tell the vendor that this is what we were doing. So they were, they kind of freaked out when they found out. But uh, we took the CPR puck and we went around and did four different scenarios with four different groups. One of them we didn't tell to do CPR. One of them we told them to prioritize getting out. Don't worry about CPR unless you think you really need to. One of them we told the specifics, kind of like what you and I were talking about. And then one we said prioritize CPR over anything else. And what we found was the uh, chest compression fraction, without getting too technical, 
the amount of time that we're on the chest versus the entire code, right? If we don't do anything, if we didn't tell the students anything, we were about 3%, which by any number is horrible. If that was my grandmother or my mother and it was somebody doing CPR, I would be really not happy with that. Um, the second group, we were up to about 12%. The third group, we were up to about 55 or 60%. And the last group, we were at 72%, which the target for CPR right now in the pre-hospital setting is 80. So you so said we're, I, the group that you told prioritized com chest compressions over everything else was hitting 72% of, of the, to the total scenario, 72% good CPR compressions. 72%. And we gave them the exact same scenario. They were on the second floor. They had a firefighter drop, no direct flame impingement. I mean, there was no immediate life yeah. threat, yeah. but the firefighter dropped and they didn't have access to stairs. There was a ladder right by the window. So they had to take the firefighter out the window. Um, and so it was the exact same scenario. We just prompted them different ways of taking care of that firefighter. So that sweet spot that I'm talking about 72 seems like a lot. That's a lot of time on the chest that we could be moving the firefighter. Um, but I ask this, even if you had the 60%, if we don't do any CPR and it takes us five or seven or 10 minutes to get that firefighter out, what did we do? No, you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right, right? We want to give them the best chance they can. I think that's what, um, yeah. what, what this is all about, right? Is, um, yes, um, and, and I, I do, I do understand where the stress reactions could come in and you're kind of, you know, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta worry about myself. But, but, you know, we, uh, we say that, you know, we're one for all, all for one. And here's a chance you do have a firefighter who's in a, who's in a different situation than you are, who's in life threatening situation. And what can you do while you're, while you're waiting? Uh, again, I mean, if you're moving, yeah. if you're moving, it's one thing, but. Yeah. And we, and we had a lot of people, listen, uh, you know, just like the tourniquet thing, I get a lot of people and it actually happened at FDIC. I had two people in the class when I asked who thinks that this won't work over bunker gear. And I had two people that put their hand up. And so I picked one of them and had them come up and put on bunker pants. And I put the tourniquet, actually it was this tourniquet, put the tourniquet over the bunker pants that a vendor had lent us. And about the third or fourth turn, the guy kind of winced. And within a few minutes, he goes, my legs completely numb. So one of the, th <laughs> it works, trust me. So one of the things that we get as far as the firefighter CPR is, well, you know, I'm going to run out of air and then I'm not any good to anybody else. And so what we found during all these time trials was that nobody ever ran out of air. We didn't have any noticeable change because what we were doing is it's only CPR when they're not moving. So as long as you're moving the firefighter out, you're not doing compression. So the faster we move, the less time we have to worry about doing that CPR. Um, but the average was like three to four minutes of CPR total. And uh, we were getting some pretty successful numbers with it. So at a minimum, what I've told people is if a firefighter goes into cardiac arrest and we do a little bit of CPR, at least I feel like I did something. At least I can sit there and say, we tried everything. Um, and we didn't sit there and, and second guess, well, should we have been doing compressions or should we have gotten them out faster? Um, from a psychological standpoint, we know that we tried everything that we could. So what, um, you said you, you, what mannequin did you use? I mean, one of the, obviously one of the ones that records your, your, uh, success, right? Actually, well, so it was actually just a dumb mannequin. I mean, I say a dumb mannequin, but it was actually a CPR, you know, a CPR mannequin, but not like one of the recessa annies that's like the, you know, the belly button up. It was the full mannequin where it had legs and arms. And then it sounds horrible, but we just duct taped this CPR puck to the chest. And that's how we were able to record depth. Now, the depth wasn't great. The CPR wasn't awesome. I mean, if, it, if I was a paramedic, supervisor or medical director, I'd be like, oh, you guys were doing horrible compressions, but it was still moving something. And so that was kind of where we, we were like, well, maybe we're actually onto something with this. No, that's good. That's awesome. And that's, that's kind of what we're, what, what I was looking for when I, when I, when I saw your, your class out there and your topics and what you could have to offer. So, um, let me go into the, uh, the skill drill here with me, stay with me for a second. And, uh, we'll look at this 
this video. We have a, a video from a um, recruit class when I was in D.C. that that these guys, these kids, uh, did the um, made a video about the firefighter CPR. But it's a pretty good uh, little video here of the firefighter CPR. They do a good job of bringing them out here, I and mean, then you'll see that it goes through the steps. Um, again, it's, it's tending to focus on the high-performance CPR. Um, you can see they they brought the firefighter out with laying on his belly, which a lot of times, you know, the firefighter comes out and sits, and he's already on his back. Uh, in this scenario, they actually started out with him on his belly. Uh, you can see the, the quick doffing of the turnout gear. One quick move, they're able to get him on his back. And then it goes through the steps. So uh, the video is kind of quick, but if you want this, again, it's on YouTube. You can find it. And then you can stop it when some of this stuff up, the step one comes up. So you can you can go through and read that to whoever's performing this or practicing this. So uh, just another um, option for us to use on the um, – Firefighter CPR. I know that Yakima, I think Yakima's got one, a video out there. There's also one, I think, from uh, Leland, North Carolina guys did one. There's a there's a firefighter CPR, I think, .com website uh, that highlights some of these things. But uh, this month, mm -hmm. you know, get out, get out, practice that, practice that. And then, you know, using what we learned in, in our, our podcast tonight, Maybe try and find a way to keep that mask on there, you know, with the, with the bypass valve open while you're taking the gear off. Uh, maybe you could, you know, slide everything underneath, kind of underneath the pack once you get the arms out of it. I know it's going to be difficult, but, you know, go through a slow time. Go through it, you know, crawling first, then then do a walk, then go for full speed if you can and see if, if, that, if that works for you. Dave, um... I really, really appreciate you coming on. I know uh, this is kind of a short show, but um, let's go back real quick, and, and I'll tell you about about Kevin McRae. Uh, that's kind of who I was going to highlight this this month. I'll look at the um, – share the screen here so you guys can get a, a picture of what Kevin looked like. This is from a fire that he um, had responded to, and I think, again, you could kind of look and see that um, – that might be like a, a poster, a poster shot that we could use, you know, in, in advertising for DCFD. Um, again, Kevin was appointed to Engine 6 um, out of recruit school after he did a cadet program, born and raised, went through high school in D.C., was appointed to Engine 6. Uh, left Engine 6 after he went to uh, Rescue Squad 1, which used to be in the firehouse with Engine 6. So it's kind of like he just slid the floor. But they were down the street now, and then um, when he got promoted to sergeant, had some good companies, lieutenant, good companies. And finally, he was lieutenant at Engine 6, in, um, where he had you know, been, a, been a private, been appointed. Um, on the day, the day that, uh, that he died, they uh, responded to a, a motor vehicle accident. And then um, while they were out of the motor vehicle crash, the fire came in. Um, spectacular fire, you know, but, but not really... Um, uh, one to write home with. It was a you know one line fire, typical of uh, those high rises and stuff in D.C. Uh, unfortunately, um, it was the time that Kevin's heart uh, did not did not survive. Um, and again, we, we can talk about this in February in Heart Health Month. We can talk about this in um, Healthy Eating Month. We can talk about it in Healthy Living Month. But um, we're talking about this month in May. It's May Day. And we're talking about, you know, uh, firefighter CPR and and also giving our firefighters the best chance of survival, um, not just the CPR, but other things we can do. Uh, think about adding some of these things to your RIT kit, you know, the tourniquets, um, the, the compresses, the the um, adhesive bandages, you know, because those are those are things that are life threats. 
And um, I think I can think about stories I've heard of, you know, plate glass windows, right? Plate glass window, it comes down and slices a firefighter. Or Dave, you mentioned the chainsaw accident, right? Someone's cutting through a plywood or cutting open a door, a chain cuts cuts a leg and we um, have a, only a few seconds to respond to that to try and make a difference in that uh, and increase the chances of survival and you know maybe even getting keeping circulation in the leg and so on so um, you know again all these things are helping us to make us hard to kill so Dave typically when I have guys on and they're tip they're usually you know talking about a friend of theirs who died or was in a close call uh, we don't have that tonight, but I asked them for two or three things that they want firefighters to take away from uh, an incident or that they want to get out on the podcast. Uh, do you have a couple of uh, things that, that we could use to kind of wrap up tonight's uh, podcast, summing up some of the things that you brought to the uh, to the show tonight? Yeah, uh, so. I'm going to, I'm going to use my own situation. Uh, cause I, you know, we talk about other people's situations a little bit in the class, but, uh, for the viewers, I, I want to be able to share my experience, which is kind of something that I think everybody can take away from. Uh, so, uh, a little after January, the beginning of January, uh, I was on a house fire at my volunteer department and, uh, we were tasked to go down to the basement to check for extension while I was sounding the stairs going down, uh, the, I, the stairs gave out, I fell through. Uh, and th the one thing that I had not experienced, uh, up until this point, we talk about it for, you know, May days and things like that. I was standing there, I was talking to my assistant chief and, uh, this is actually right before I got promoted. So I was talking to my assistant chief and I turned around and I sounded the stairs. And the next thing I know, I heard somebody screaming, mayday, mayday, mayday over the radio. And I thought, oh, crap, somebody fell. Like they said, firefighter through the floor. And I went, oh, crap, somebody fell through the floor. And I'm looking around. I'm like, where is everybody? And then they kept saying, mayday, mayday, mayday. And finally, command came back and said, okay, acknowledge the mayday. They said, firefighter melon through the floor. And I went, oh, that's me. That's really bad. And I looked down, and I realized that I was the one that fell through. So when we talk about there's times where you don't realize that things are happening until after it's already over. Um, and so when I tried to key up on the radio, I couldn't get through any of the radio traffic. They were still calling the mayday and this is all within the first, you know, five to 10 seconds. Um, but I got to the point where they had already called the mayday. They already knew that I was down through the floor. They're screaming for me. I'm trying to scream for them. Um, communication became very, very hard. And so, uh, ultimately what I ended up doing was pulling, I took a huge breath and I pulled my mask back and I screamed, would everybody shut the expletive up? And it got very, very quiet for about five seconds. And I said, I'm fine. There's fire down here. It's hot. Can you give me a hose? And so they handed me down a hose line. I was able to put out a, it was a trash can worth of fire. Um, but what ended up happening is the stairs had collapsed and I went into them and it was like a Chinese finger trap. So the more that I kept trying to push myself up, the more it was jamming into my sides and I couldn't get out. Um, and so <clears throat> the next thing that came down was a rip pack. And I remember hearing a thud and I looked over and I saw the reflective of the rip pack and I thought, okay, it's raining equipment. So that's good. They know that I'm here. Um, and then I saw a ladder come down. And it wasn't until I actually went back and replayed a lot of us have dash cam or uh, helmet cams. And then we have some dash cams as well. And so when I pieced it all together, this whole thing took about three minutes from start to finish. And so by the time they got the ladder down and I was able to, I actually used an Anderson rescue strap and th threw it up through one of the rungs and was able to pull myself up while kind of moving my leg. Um, but when I came up out of that hole, it was like three and a half minutes. And so as a testament, and this is where the story's going, is as a testament, every single thing that we trained on with this crew, they did. And so, you know, when we talk about you don't rise to the level of your expectation, you actually fall to the lowest level of your training, which is Archilicos, uh, it's true. In that stressful situation, they watched me drop through the stairs and they saw embers and fire come up out of the basement. They didn't know if I was burning to death. They didn't know what was going on. Um, but immediately somebody that was a hundred and probably 150 feet away 
saw what was going on and grabbed a ladder off of a rig and ran over to the basement stairs with it. Somebody else that was in the front yard heard a mayday and they grabbed the rip bag and ran over. Somebody that had a hose line, because we had three hose lines off, somebody that was on an attack line knew that the other crew had a better angle on the fire that was on the other side of the building. They took their line and ran around and dropped it in the hole. So all these things happened in three and a half minutes because we trained to be realistic and we trained on things that were important when that really happens. And so, uh, again, I talk about it in the class, but you know, so often we get stuck in just doing check boxes. And so what I want the listeners to do is think outside the box, train for things that are realistic. Um, but you don't always have to look at the check boxes, get out there and try and do some of those things because when you do it works. Yeah, I hadn't heard that before. That's a, that's great. That's a great story. And I guess you being an official in that volunteer department, it had to be like a uh, aha moment that like all the sweat and 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 tears and time away and you know I'm sure your family's like there goes dad again down to the firehouse, and now it's like holy crap, it's all you know paying off. Um, ironic that it was your rescue. I'm sure you were leading a lot of those trainings and now here they are rescuing you and it's, it's great that they kept their heads together because again like like i said i can imagine you're like oh there's one of our guys who's trapped in there holy crap what are we going to do well they they knew what to do um so hopefully that message that message is perfect for tonight um we added some new stuff to to our, uh, our our writ rescue rolodex, right? Um, adding some 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 tips some tips to to what we can do to improve our firefighters' chances of survival, making us hard to kill. Um, uh, a great great phrase there from Leadership Under Fire guys that coined that, and I I like to use it. But that's what we're trying to do, right? Um, again, most of most of what we're trying to do is prevent a mayday. But if a mayday does happen. We want to be able to, like like Dave's crew, shining star, shining moment there, that we want to be able to give give our firefighters the best chance of survival. And it doesn't just stop when they get out of the building. Tonight's message is that that um, you know get that we, we've got some really good guys out there. We've got some really good medics. I was never a medic, um, but I I can I can spot a, a good medic, <laughs> and I like good medics, right? Um, because I, I've needed a medic a few times, um, so it's good to have a medic that you know it's going to be going to be a good one so um let's keep that care going from um rescue to delivery to the to the hospital and get them get them the best care they can um just a couple wrap-ups uh thank you peter thank you matt matt wasn't here tonight but we got peter our old um producer was back with us hopefully you guys like the new the new um introduction video that they've added to the mayday mondays um, I was I was surprised with that when I saw the show last month, and we had that. Um, well, again, hopefully the the audio and video and everything is working out. Thank you to to Dave Mellon. I appreciate you coming on short notice. It's good stuff. I I mean, um, we got a, just a taste of what what you're doing there. I think that you know maybe we can come back and and revisit some more um, on on what you're doing. The medical response to the firefighter mayday, uh, perfect for tonight. Uh, Peter, thank you. Uh, Fire Engineering, thank you. Um, and this is the May 2023 Mayday Monday. Thank you, and we'll see you next month.